Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about Christine Granville, a hero, a soldier, a secret agent, and one of the most amazing women who has ever lived. But being cast aside by a government who no longer needed her skills, her cruel death marked a sad demise for Churchill's favourite spy. Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 97, Christine Granville, The Fall of a Forgotten Hero. Today, I'm standing in Lexham Gardens in Kensington, W8. Four streets north of the home of Elizabeth McClendon's deluded killer. Three streets west of the basement where serial killer John George Haig dissolved the entire McSwan family. And a quarter of a mile south of the first sadistic murder by Neville Heath. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Situated one mile from three of London's best museums, but nowhere near anything of interest except for a huge Sainsbury's and half a billion hotels, this part of Kensington is posh, but pointless. You know it's posh, as nothing has prices and nobody smiles. You know it's pointless, as although each flat is sold for a minimum of 1.5 million quid a pop, most of its owners only have enough money left for a faulty facelift, a scarf cut from roadkill, teeth made from Steinway keys, a teeny tiny legless dog who lives in a bag, and a personalised licence plate, which is meant to read Anu 5, but instead it looks like anus. The only view here is the noisy A4 trunk road which rips through its heart. So as the pseudo-posh people sup a thimble's worth of Balinese demi-capu coffee and nibble on a tiny custard tart, from a box it takes longer to wrap than the cake takes to bake. As they eat al fresco by the side of the road, each morsel is munched with a shot of grit as a sewage truck thunders by and a whiff of part-digested burgers as a builder takes a dump by the bins and then wipes his ass with a discarded copy of horse and hound. Just off the A4, at number one Lexham Gardens, stands the Lexham Gardens Hotel, an unassuming five-story townhouse built with white and yellow bricks, a stucco facade, Doric columns and black wrought iron gates. Formerly known as the Shelbourne, this was once a shabby place to stay for those who were down on their luck one of whom was a fearless woman, who we all owe our lives and our freedom. She was known as Christine Granville, but there were no statues, no street names, and no public holidays in her honour, as with her bravery, cunning and resilience no longer needed to defeat the Nazis, one of the greatest ever secret agents became a nobody, whose name is as neglected today as the day she died. Only Churchill's favourite spy didn't die the glorious heroic death that her life had been. Instead, being abandoned, broke and unloved, her sad and tragic end was so mundane, it's an insult to her memory. As it was here, on Sunday the 15th of June 1952, the Christine Granville was murdered. Only her end wasn't at the hands of a hired assassin 
a rogue state, or a bitter rival, but a nobody with a grudge. Until 1941, Christine Granville did not exist. Her name was an alias, and although she was known as Christina Zizetsky, Christina Getlik, Pauline Armand, and Olga Polovsky, her real name was Christina Skarbek. Her life was thrilling, dangerous, and heroic. But it all could have been so very different. Maria Christina Janina Skarbek was born on the 1st of May 1908, near Warsaw, Poland. The youngest of two children, to Count Jerzy Skarbek, a Catholic aristocrat, and Countess Stefania Goldfeder, heiress to a Jewish banking empire. Raised in wealth and privilege, Christina's childhood was easy and carefree, as every whim was catered for by tutors, servants, and stablemen. As a perfect mix of both parents, Christina was a stunning girl, blessed with her mother's boundless compassion and radiant beauty. She was a tomboy, with her father's love of sports and adventure, all of which was combined with a Catholic guilt, a Jewish sense of injustice, and a devout patriotism. Being a girl, although a fast learner, who was fluent in Polish, French and Yiddish, and who could pass as an Italian, a Russian or a Spaniard, she was only gifted a basic education. Being a tall, elegant brunette, who came sixth in the Miss Poland contest, and whose captivating looks made many men tremble, her only career was to be as a wife and a mother. And so, as a wealthy heiress, who kept herself occupied by horse riding, hunting and skiing. She was bright, brave and beautiful, but also rebellious and bored. Following the Great Depression, in 1930, Christina's father died. They were forced to sell their country estate and the Goldfeder Empire collapsed, leaving Countess Stefania an impoverished widow. To pay her way, Christina moved out and worked a regular job at a car dealership. But seeing shadows on her lungs, coughing up blood, and diagnosed with tuberculosis, the same disease which had killed her father, she was advised to find herself an outdoor occupation, which severely limited her options. The same year, having briefly married a very dull businessman called Gustav Getlik, which didn't last the year. By 1932, she was ill, she was broke, and as a shameful divorcee, she was a lady without love. Christina could have been just another little rich girl who fell on hard times. But being blessed with guts, grit, and determination, her privileged upbringing had been the perfect training for her new life as a spy. It all began, quite literally, by accident. As although she was an expert skier who easily traversed even the deadliest of black runs on the mountain retreat of Zakopane, having momentarily lost her footing, Christina's life was saved by the giant physique and huge personality of Zhertsi Zizitsky. Just like her, he was wealthy, loving, and bored. Being restless, he was a diplomat and an author, and burdened by a thirst for travel, a radical brain, and a taste for danger. Zhertsi was the perfect cure. On the 2nd of November 1938, they married in Warsaw, traveled to Africa, and with Zhertsi promoted to the post of Poland's consular general, they moved to Ethiopia. Every day was a new adventure, but the real excitement was yet to come. 
On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland from the west. On the 17th, the Soviets invaded from the east. And within four weeks, their entire country was smashed and World War II had begun. Days later, Pristina and Scherzi sailed to London and volunteered their services as Allied spies to the British Secret Intelligence Service. As a well-travelled diplomat with a colourful past, Scherzi was accepted. But as a woman, a foreigner and a Jew, Christina was treated with derision and suspicion. In their hands, they had the perfect spy. She was brilliant, beautiful, cunning and bold. She was an expert skier, horse rider and marksman. She spoke many languages. She could pass for French, Italian, Spanish and Russian. And best of all, she would die for her country. And yet, they almost let her slip by. But being described by a high-ranking official as a flaming Polish patriot, a great adventuress and absolutely bloody fearless, Christina was given a chance. Her first mission was one she devised herself. On the 23rd of December 1939, with Hungary having allied with the Nazis, Christina snuck into Budapest, printed thousands of propaganda leaflets, and aided by her old family friend, Andrzej Kowerski. She navigated cliff faces, avalanches, and deadly precipices in the sub-zero temperatures of the Tatra Mountains. And as a half-Jewish spy, she re-entered Nazi-occupied Poland, completed her mission, and then remained there to sabotage the German intelligence free any political prisoners and to assist the resistance fighters to escape. All of which, if captured, she would be shot as a spy and exterminated as a Jew. But so successful were Christina and Andre's secret missions that a bounty was offered for their capture, arrest or death. Following the failure of Dunkirk, with the Allies on the back foot, and Germany poised to attack just miles from the English coast. Churchill no longer saw this as a gentlemanly war, to be played by some old-school generals according to the rules of engagement. It was now time to be dirty and devious. In July 1940, under a top-secret directive, the Special Operations Executive was established with their headquarters at 64 Baker Street. Their mission was to confuse, sabotage and disrupt the enemy in a covert and deceitful way. Churchill didn't want a soldier, as every SOE operative needed to be a master of escape, disguise and explosives, who was invisible to the eye, inaudible to the ear and yet deadly enough to kill an unarmed assassin with a knife, a rope, a makeshift shiv, and even their bare hands. What he needed was a self-taught super spy. What he got was Christina Scarbeck, and she would quickly become SOE's first British female agent, their longest serving spy, and one of the most respected. Having adopted the alias of Christine Granville to aid her return to English soil, Christina spied on enemy troop movements, transports and oil fields. She assisted the French and Italian resistance. She organised a smuggling network between Warsaw and Budapest. She sabotaged communications and bridges right up the River Danube. And even though both countries had signed a non-aggression pact, she filmed the first evidence of German troops poised to invade their ally, the Soviet Union. On the 22nd of July 1941, as Hitler unleashed Operation Barbarossa, Churchill held Christina as his favourite spy. But she wasn't just brave and ruthless, she was also cunning and inventive. In January 1941, 
was being interrogated by the Gestapo. By biting down hard on her tongue and coughing up blood, she feigned tuberculosis. And worried that they might contract it, her Gestapo captors quickly released her. Once stopped by German soldiers on the Italian border, when they ordered her to put her hands up, under each arm, she unveiled a live grenade and threatened to blow them all sky high if they didn't disappear, which they did. And in July 1944, having parachuted into southern France, she secured the release of two SOE agents and resistance fighters held in a Nazi prison just hours before their execution by lying, threatening and bribing the Gestapo commander with two million francs that she didn't have. Christina Skarbek, alias Christine Granville, had survived illness, poverty, accidents, interrogation, war and execution. There had been a reward for her arrest, a death sentence on her head, and yet, having changed the outcome of the war, across both allies and enemies, she was feared and respected. But by May 1945, with the world no longer at war, her new battle was about to begin. Many soldiers had died, but for those who had survived, their homecoming was bittersweet. Gone was the thrill, the camaraderie, the four square meals and the steady wage, as having returned to the blackened smoke and shell of a country they had fought for, with their homes bombed, their loved ones missing and their lives shattered. In a simple ceremony, their heroic deeds were honoured with a cheaply made mass-produced medal, and just as quickly, these brave soldiers were forgotten. One such soldier was Christina Skarbek. On the 14th of May 1945, just two weeks after Adolf Hitler's death, Christina's service as an SOE agent was terminated. Communications ceased. She was trapped in Cairo, dismissed with a month's salary, and left to fend for herself. After six years of service and six years apart, Christina and her husband Jerzy had split. And as the Allies had siphoned off her Polish homeland from the tyrannical claws of the fascists, to now be ruled under an equally brutal communist dictatorship, she no longer had a country, a home or a family, as both her mother and her brother had been exterminated in the Nazi death camps. To add insult to injury, in May 1947, her heroism was rewarded with Europe's highest honours, as she was made an OBE, an MBE, and awarded the George Medal, as well as the prestigious Croix de Guerre, which recognised her contribution to the liberation of France. Only she couldn't afford to live, as the British government would repeatedly deny her a work permit, a passport, and even British citizenship. Struggling to adapt to civilian life, to make ends meet, Christina Scarbeck, OBE, MBE, George Medal, Croix de Guerre, the liberator of France, the saviour of England, and Churchill's favourite spy, was forced to undertake a series of badly paid menial jobs, such as a switchboard operator, a cafe waitress, and a sales girl at Harrods. And as the months turned into years, she became depressed and isolated. On the 3rd of May 1951, after years in the civilian wilderness, Christina found work as a stewardess on board the maiden voyage of the MS Roahini, a luxury passenger liner for the New Zealand Shipping Company, which sailed from the Port of London to Wellington and Auckland. Her duties were fruitless. She served drinks, she made beds, and she took orders. 
But as the captain had insisted that all of his crew wear their wartime decorations, as many had only received a standard campaign medal, Christina's chest full of citations created an uneasy sense of jealousy and resentment amongst her shipmates. Just three weeks in, Christina wrote a letter to her childhood friend, SOE collaborator and occasional lover, Andrei Kowalski. The letter was brief, her mood was sullen, and in it, she wrote that all the other stewards were not very friendly, all except one. She never mentioned his name or gave any details, but this 41-year-old bathroom attendant was captivated by her beauty, enraptured by her heroic tales, and his boundless attention and undying friendship made this lonely lady feel loved again. Christina Scarbeck was a living legend, whereas Dennis Muldowney was a nobody. The early life of Dennis George Muldowney is impossible to verify, as being a pitiful loser and a deluded fantasist, many aspects of his fictional upbringing were fiercely disputed by all three of his siblings. Born on the 16th of July 1910, in Wigan, Lancashire. By the time of his trial, Dennis had concocted a fanciful tale to inflate his humdrum existence and to excuse his appalling crime. His claims were that he'd been beaten black and blue by his drunken father, abandoned by his abusive mother, which had left him with a fear of the dark, that both parents had sexually abused him, and that all four siblings were bastards born out of incest. But none of this ever happened. In fact, his simple life was actually rather dull. Easily distracted as a boy, Dennis left school with no skills, no friends, and no qualifications. He was boastful, lazy, and prone to daydreaming. He liked reading, but mostly just comic books about spies. And having claimed that he'd been introduced to masturbation at the age of six, he was obsessed with sex. Unable to concentrate, between 1923 and 1952, he flitted from job to job, working briefly as an errand boy, a counterhand, a builder, a hairdresser, a butler, a fire warden, a waiter, a dispatch rider, a ship steward and a hall porter. With his work record never attaining a level higher than satisfactory, as he was often absent, having suffered from frequent bouts of depression at his own failure. He married a local girl called Kath in 1929. They had a boy called John in 1940, and she divorced him in 1947 on the grounds of cruelty, owing to his fantasies, his masturbatory habits, and his nightly demands for sexual intercourse. He didn't drink, do drugs, he had no criminal record, and according to his siblings, there was no history of insanity in the family. So it's no surprising that, as an unattractive depressed failure, who was recently single, heavily in debt, and had lived such a dull life, that unlike his shipmates who had all served in the war, he didn't have a single medal to wear. But as both he and Christina ascended the MS Roahini in Glasgow Dock, he fell for her beauty, he pitied her loneliness, and he marvelled at the thrilling life she had led. Following his arrest, he told the police about her many male admirers, of her endless sexual conquests, and how he had tried to end their passionate affair. But lured in by all the cunning of this raven-haired beauty, he became her slave of love. And having fallen under her spell, he later claimed, She murdered me. In truth, Christina was stuck on a cruise ship for the next two and a half months with a deluded loser. But as a woman, 
who had duped the Gestapo and evaded the Nazis. She knew how to keep the peace. By July 1951, having docked in London, as promised, Christina kept it cordial and introduced Dennis to her friends at the White Eagle Club. But being obsessed by Christina, he didn't talk to anyone but her. By February 1952, being convinced that she loves me and can't live without me, as he boarded his next ship, the MS Donata Castle, which was bound for the Caribbean, whilst in the company of another man, she supposedly kissed him goodbye and promised to write, but she never did. By April 1952, upon his return, as his unrequited love had been left to fester for two long months, and with no letters, no calls, no contact, and as she had moved to a new hotel, seeing his goddess in the arms of another lover, he swore he would kill her and himself. That night, he purchased a knife, a kosh, and a vial of poison. He resigned as the ship's toilet attendant, he got a job as a porter at the Reform Club so he could keep surveillance on her usual haunts. And even though she had left on a six-week voyage to Durban, his anger would fester for a very long time. On Friday the 13th of June 1952, six weeks later, a cruise liner called the Winchester Castle docked in the port of London. Down the walkway, disembarked a tall, dark stewardess. As 44-year-old Christina Scarbeck returned to the land that she had fought for. Being older and wiser, her sprightly footsteps now shuffled, her lightning-fast reactions had slowed, and her highly-tuned senses had dulled, as this once great secret agent was fatigued by a menial, lonely and demeaning existence. Being tired, broke and lonely, she dragged her trunk of memories and medals to the Shelbourne Hotel at No. 1 Lexham Gardens. A cheap but clean place to stay she had occupied several times before. And having been rejected for every military and diplomatic post she had applied, this lady, who had changed the course of the Second World War, began a new job as the hotel's housekeeper. It had been another long day for Christina, having scrubbed and swept the hotel from top to bottom and all for minimum wage. She had cleaned it all, from the guest rooms, to her bedroom, to the dining room, all the way down the carpeted stairs to the white-tiled hall by the ground floor door, where just a few moments later, her dead body would lay. Being a late night, with an early start tomorrow, having popped out for dinner and a few glasses of wine, she was tired out and ready for bed. At 10.30pm, Christina ascended the stone steps up to the Shelbourne Hotel and entered the white door of the very thin hall. With her hearing weakened by the persistent bangs of the Nazi gunshots she had dodged, and the boom of the enemy bridges she had blown to smithereens. She didn't hear her assailant behind her, as having skulked amongst the shadows for an hour and a half, he followed her in with a cosh in his waistband, a six-inch sheath knife in his jacket, and a vial of poison in his pocket. Halfway up the carpeted stairs, hearing the door lock click, Christina turned, to see Dennis Muldowney. The slim, dark-haired, sharp-nosed, 42-year-old former bathroom attendant who had plagued her with love letters, calls, gifts, and after more than a year, had refused to get the message that they were not lovers, they were only friends. Trained to negotiate with Nazis, Christina didn't argue, as being too smart and too tired in a muted voice, she calmly led Dennis back down to the hall. 
as she didn't see him as a threat. He was just a pest. As Christina calmly walked this pathetic little man across towards the door, having rejected many male advances before, she made it clear that she was going away and that they would never see each other ever again. For Christina, this was the end of their friendship. But for Dennis, this was the end of their lives. Being a tired, broken shell of her former self, whose brain was clouded by fatigue and whose senses were dulled by depression, she never saw the assassin's weapon. She only felt a fast thud as his fist hit her chest. But looking down at her left breast, she saw a knife's handle protruding, as the full six-inch blade had penetrated her breastbone, severed the artery to her lungs, and split her heart in half. Having collapsed to the bottom of the stairs, as her legs buckled under her, Christina slumped hard against the writing desk in a crumpled heap, and with her eyes wide open, her mouth aghast, as her body cavity quickly filled. In an instant, she was dead. Dennis Muldowney was a liar, a fantasist and a failure. Desperate for attention, upon his arrest, he swallowed the vial of poison. But as it was only granulated aspirin, all the tacky powder did was stick to his dentures. In prison, he fashioned his bedsheets into a noose, but they were only for show. In the press, he bitched about how she was getting more attention than he was. And on the 9th of September 1952, at the Old Bailey, standing with his hands in his pockets, he asked the judge to hurry it up. As during the three-minute trial, Dennis pleaded guilty and was hanged three weeks later. Christina Scarbeck, alias Christine Granville, was the bravest, boldest, and without doubt, one of the most amazing women who had ever lived. She was a self-taught secret agent who had liberated countries, thwarted Nazis, rescued resistance fighters, and having risked her life, without her, we might not have the freedom and peace that we enjoy today except for two small memorials, organized and paid for by those who loved her. There are no statues, streets, or holidays in her name. Instead, her memory is sullied by a few tawdry tabloid articles about how Churchill's favorite spy was slain by the single blade of a deluded stalker. Only he didn't kill her. It was the British government who did. Having sacked her, abandoned her, fobbed her off with a few medals, a month's salary, and routinely denied her a passport, a work permit, and the British citizenship that she deserved. Having sacrificed everything and volunteered to protect us. As a final insult, on her death certificate, there was no mention of her heroism, her rank, or her bravery as instead of being listed as a spy, an agent, or a soldier, having previously been a divorcee, she is remembered only as a former wife. Christina was buried at St Mary's Cemetery in Kensal Green. In 2013, the Polish Heritage Society gave her a proper headstone. And today, at the foot of her grave, lies the ashes of her friend, agent and lover, Andrzej Kowalski, who it is said she was due to marry. Her name was Christina Skarbek. She was the hero we forgot, but the one we must never forget. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. After the break...
was a long one. That was a long one. Oh, Christ. Oh, big stretch. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Big yawn. Well, there we go. Whoa, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. That's quite an interesting story, that one. Oh, another one of those ones about forgotten wartime heroes. Kind of a nice companion piece to go with the Glyndor Michael one, Ep 40. So we've got that one as well. Always on the lookout for kind of stories like that. As you know, each week I try and give you something different. Sometimes it's mental health ones, sometimes it's a family domestic ones, and then sometimes it's a a, a military one that gets thrown in. Uh, not all stories kind of make it into Murder Mile because they have to have that special kind of something in there. There has to be a sadness in there. Do you know? Uh, there, there, so, uh, it takes a while. So it takes a while to kind of get used to the fact of looking through cases and just thinking. Do you know? Sometimes pe- people very kindly send me cases, and I look at them and I go, "Yeah, it's fine, but it's just a story about a, someone who cuts someone's head off." And you read it, and you just go, uh, "It's just dull." I, I find that sometimes it's not the brutality of the crimes that makes a, a, a case interesting. It's kind of. It's it's all of the backstory to their lives. It's all of the sadness. It's all the irony. That's what happens. So even with this story, when you look at kind of her murder, it's a single stab to the heart. But it's not about her death. It's not the death bit that's important. It's about how, how she was treated by the government, how she was abandoned, how much she'd given up. That's all important. And then it's kind of the, the, the cherry on the cake is kind of irony at the end is that... Do you know, she didn't die a hero's death. She kind of, do you know, she was working a crappy job. She hadn't got any money. She'd been forgotten. All she had with her really was a suitcase with some medals in it and stuff like that. So it's quite sad, really. Anyway, we'll get into some more details in a bit. Uh, I'm going to go and put my tea on and open a window, I think, because it's getting a bit it's getting a bit chummy in here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do uh, extra stuff and questions. So I'm moving away from the microphone. La 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 la. Doors open. Oh dear. It's nice. It's uh, the wind's picking up. We've had. I think I've mentioned this quite a few times that we've had. Uh, we've had quite a few weeks. Like May was what the hottest month in Britain, and we were getting up to like sometimes 25, 26 degrees, which you know for everyone else is probably not probably not hot, but for me it's a bit too hot. It's a bit too chummy. A bit too meaty. Whereas now, it's gone, it's nice, it's perfect for me. It's like, it's cloudy, high chance of rain. There's a nice wind blowing through. For me, that's really nice. It's peaceful, I quite like that. So, tea's on, powdered milk out. Belgian burn again. I just, uh, there's not much choice in the shops at the moment. So, we're just sticking with a standard Belgian bun. Windows open. Oh dear. Good. So, uh, oh, uh, hello. Welcome to Extra Mile. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Extra Mile, the uh, unedited bit, blah, 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 blah. Well, I give you some extra information on the case and we do a quiz and there's other stuff. Right, right. Um, Just to say, so we're on episode 97 now. I've got all the episodes planned for the next year. And even if even if uh, the virus does a comeback, I've got enough to kind of last as... I reckon until next summer anyway but um next week next four weeks going to be slightly different because i i kind of as you know it's like it's like 100 hours a week to do each episode excluding research and they're pretty exhausting and because each episode is weekly but it takes me eight or nine days to do each episode i kind of run out of time as i go along so i need to times to kind of catch up and give myself a break so the next four weeks going to be slightly different what i'm going to do uh, I, th- I think the first two weeks are going to be I'm going to do, do some meander miles so they're the ones where I take you on, on a proper guided walk unedited we kind of walk down a street and I show I show you where all the murder cases are and you can you can follow me v- via pictures that I'll take or uh, a lot of clever people have started using Google Maps to follow me so you can do that that's really good as well so the thing, first one that I've, I've been working on is Chinatown Chinatown's pretty exciting because when I first started doing Murder Mile the Walks, I thought oh, I could do just a whole walk just to based on all the murders in Chinatown, just down Gerard Street, because it's a tiny street that's it's only about 400 feet long. But there's, 
I thought, there's so many murders that I know about here, but there's no evidence. It's one of these places where they just don't talk about things. It's like murders happen and it gets swept under the carpet. So I'm doing a whole episode just on murders that I know about and ones that we've heard about and it's it's, it'll be quite interesting we'll just do a little walk down the streets it'll take about an hour but you can have fun uh i'm going to try and do one just around piccadilly circus because obviously we've got a lot of blackout ripper haunts around there but it's quite a busy place so i want to do uh piccadilly and the kind of surrounding streets so that will be good then oh there's a little burp then and then um i'm going to do two episodes of something called stripped uh, stripped is I've had it on my mind for a while quite often there's cases that I, I, I would love to tell you about but the problem is there's not enough information you can't get the court documents do you know um, so these are cases where I can't give you a full background like I would with this where we go through a person's whole life and you learn all about them quite often all we do is know a bit about the case and that's not enough for me quite often but uh, there's still a couple of stories that I think are really interesting so what I'm going to do is stripped stripped has be uh it won't be as nicely edited as regular murder mile it's going to be a bit of a freeform conversation uh but what i'm going to do uh it's a uh, 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 kind of it uh oh god my bro oh, my energy's gone it just slumped uh it's kind of a, an interesting way of me explaining the story but it, it but all of this is a chance to give me a chance to have a little bit of a rest but also research the next 10 12 15 cases because they, they still need work on them and also as i go through the season sometimes i find new cases and i plop them in i found one the other day and i was like oh that has to go into this season so uh that's gonna happen for right uh what else is going on uh still where we am uh the boat needs to move in a couple of days so i'm gonna have to move the boat which is a real shame because i've quite enjoyed it here but as i mentioned before for some reason the canal and river trust to run the waterway have decided we have to move even though there's still a virus and we're still the second worst infection rate and death rate in the world and uh us moving our boats doesn't really serve a purpose but we've got to move on and i need to get some uh water and some gas because i'm running out of water and gas so tea's almost done right tea's up two sugars and uh obviously me powdered milk because it's gone a bit too warm for regular milk i bought because i've got a fridge i bought a regular milk the other day just a little one and by the next morning it turned into a cheese it's a really thick horrible cheese so that's horrible um uh, and milk bag milk bag what the frick is milk bag um tea bag of choice today uh is a yorkshire tea so I'm not on the PDs today. I'm on the Yorkshire tea. It, it gives a, it's a nice, satisfying tea, and it's got a, uh, it's got a nice kind of brown colour when you're doing it. The colours are kind of a creamy, caramelly brown, but it's a nice tea as well. It's got a nice smell. It's not too bitter, and uh, it's, it's slightly sweet. It's nice. Yorkshire tea is very nice. So, or if you like, you can have one called the Yorkshire biscuit tea. That's quite nice as well. Oh, right. Ooh. and I have some chocolate digestives to go. And no, before you ask, I still haven't been able to find those uh, 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 Bakewell Tart digestives, the flavoured ones. I still uh, mm, don't know whether I will. Right, OK, let's do questions. Um, as you know, as always, I haven't edited the episode you've just listened to yet. I'm just recording it now. So I don't know which of these questions may end up in the episode. They may ended up, end up getting deleted out. So... Uh, but of course, if you're a patron subscriber, every Thursday when the episode goes out, you get you get the original script, which goes with it as well. So everything that is edited uh, before it's edited is in that script. So you get all the extra stuff that no one ever hears about. So here's the question. Some may be in the episode, some won't. But let's do this. OK, question one. What title were Christina's parents? Question two, which ski report, the ski report, which ski, th oh, I've written report here, now my brain can't get out of it. Which ski resort in Poland did Christina train at 
two-part question. And which former Polish soldier was born there? He came from a, an earlier episode in this season. So it's a two-part question. What was a ski, ski resort that Christina trained at as a skier? And which character, Polish soldier from a former episode, also came from there as well? Uh, question three. What was Christina's first ordinary job after her father's death? Question four. What did Christina have under her armpits when confronted by two German troops? You have to admit, she's quite a woman, isn't she? It's quite amazing. Uh, question five. Uh, how did a high-ranking official describe Christina to the SOE? SOE, the Special Operations Executive. Uh, I'm just going to change something there, add something in. Uh, question six. What was the code name of Hitler's mission to invade his ally, the Soviet Union? Even if you don't remember that, if you know your history, you'll know what that's called. Uh, question seven. Uh, what were Christina's four awards from the French and British governments? Apart from, apart from being shat on, obviously. Uh, question eight. Uh, who were the... Question eight. Who... Who... Come on, brain. Question eight. So tired. Question eight. Where were the headquarters of the Special Operations Executive? Briefly mentioned in there. Uh, the, if you're... Again, sorry. If you're a Patreon subscriber, I did a series called... Uh, uh, places which changed the world it was a little six part series i did it was only for uh, uh on patreon and i think episode two or three actually featured where the special operations executive uh offices were uh, question nine what three weapons did dennis take with him to kill her and himself and here's a tough one let's see if you can remember this one question 10 christina was her middle name along with janina but what was her first name? Because it wasn't Christina. Mm. Right, okay, let's get into some extra details about this case. Uh, as mentioned in here, thanks to Danny Rolf uh, for... Weirdly, this was one of these cases where I'm always searching for new cases and, and, and having a poke around. And I, I've got a list of kind of cases that I'd love to... I've got some that are in the East End, but I'm probably never going to go to the East End. And I had some, because at the point of when it... Um, when Danny messaged me, I was still only doing Soho and Fitzrovia and nothing further. Like, I think I'd gone as far as Mayfair. And then this I, I knew about this case. I was like, oh, it's too bloody far because it's Kensington. I'm never going to go do Kensington because I was trying to keep it all consistent. But then I got a bit bored and thought, let's branch it out a bit. So I, I actually put it on a backbone and thought I won't go for that. And then I got an email from Danny about got about a year and a half ago saying have you ever thought about doing this case and I was like no it's too far away from me but you know it's a really interesting case and then when this season happened because I'd already started moving into Kensington for like Notting Hill and stuff that and one day I was just thinking what new cases can I do and I went what was that what was that email that that guy sent me ages ago and I typed in spy into my um into my google and then it just popped up. It just it was like Danny's message going, what about Chris, uh, Christine Grenville? And I was like, of course, Christine Grenville. That could, the case. Oh. And it's such a good case as well. It's so sad as well. So thanks, Danny, for that. That was a, that was a nice reminder. Uh, and it is a fantastic story. So uh, let's go into some details that uh, I didn't get into the episode. Uh, well, I definitely didn't get into the episode because I didn't record them. So um, interestingly, it is believed that uh, Christine Grenville, let's, uh, Christine Scarbeck, real name, had a love affair with Ian Fleming, the writer of the 007 uh, novels. Um, she was quite well known for, uh, apparently, uh, uh, they always say her sexual con conquest, but, you know, she was, she was uh, I was going to say ladies' man, whatever the opposite of ladies' man in a uh, woman's, uh, man's woman. I don't, I don't even know what the difference, what, how to do the opposite version of that. But she liked men. She liked attention. She was very attractive. She could kind of lure in many men. She could kind of, you know, get stupid and let men like me to fall at her knees and stuff like that. But she was romantically linked to uh, Ian Fleming, who was obviously a novelist, but he was a former spy himself. He was former British intelligence. Um, apparently the two dated for about a year. Um, 
according to uh, the guy who was kind of Ian Fleming's uh, author. Um, and if you look at uh, the Ian Fleming book Casino Royale, you see there's a character in there called Vesper Lind. <coughs> and Ves- Vesper Lind is kind of the, the double agent that, that's in there. Um, a lot of the exploits of Ve- Vesper Lind actually mirror what Christine Scarbeck did. And interestingly, when you look into... I, I saw this only when I was going through the original police files and looking at her back history. Um, Christina's nickname from her father was Vespa. So, um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, many people have used uh, Christine Scarbeck's story as kind of a a, a, um, a a kind of a good template for kind of really, really fascinating characters. And obviously, obviously, uh, uh, Vespa in Casino Royale is played by my girlfriend, Eva Green. Uh, uh, mm, uh, thank God I'm sitting down. Right. Uh, interestingly, there was a letter in the file that I was going to use in here because it gives a kind of interesting insight into uh, Dennis Muldowney's brain. It was a letter that was sent from Brixton Prison after he was arrested. It was a three-page letter, a massive rant. But I, I didn't put it all in. I didn't copy it all down. But there's some interesting bits. So this was dated 11th of September 1952 from Brixton Prison and he sent it to his uh, his siblings who were Jack, Frank and Marie. I'm just going to read bits of it. It kind of gives you any good insight into kind of his, his thought pattern. So this was from Dennis. Dear Frank, Jack and Marie. I'm not going to do the voice. You may... He, he doesn't say that. That's me saying that. Uh, you may as well know that I hate to write this letter. I would rather keep silent. I, I would have done... I would have done just that had it not been for Frank's abortive attempt to see me because I know what it much must cost him the shame uh there is never nevertheless there is nevertheless the that unfortunate fact the blood tie he's writing is all is really appalling which must affect you three that is my one regret nothing else underlined exclamation marks so he says he's got no regrets about what he did Christine literally and metaphorically asked for that for that she got I am sorry but that's the truth she hadn't jilted me as the press has it she wanted me put on ice she wanted to put me on an arrangement which was quite unacceptable for me as an as a man uh I didn't write all of this in, but he says he he references not lamenting the past or worrying about the future. Then uh, much the same as Christine, however, she was not all that younger than I am. uh, And she was getting a little rough around the edges, which is very kind of him. uh, As she was well aware. Anyway, I have no kicks. We really had something, she and I. um, It may have been a little bit stormy, but it was never a bore. Da, da, da. It's, it's a really really pompous letter it's quite badly written anyway um he explains in there why he didn't want a lawyer he said there was no aid for uh christine why should i ask for aid uh to take the life of another is a jungle law and such is unforgivable i concur but to take a life and then attempt to escape retribution behind the cloak of insanity rather despicable don't you think uh, to his siblings, he uh, he didn't have much to leave. Frank, he left a calendar watch and a cameo ring. To Jack, he left his uh, uh, cigarette lighter and watch case. To his sister Marie, he left two ring necklace sets, uh, <laughs> which he said he had bought her as a gift but never got round to sending them to you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I came to the conclusion that my son, he had a son called John, who hasn't sinned since his son was about 12 years old, uh, would not want anything of mine. He was educated to the fact that I did not exist. Therefore, a bridge I burnt. We've seen so little of each other over the years. You hardly know me. Uh, I was never really one for you. Perhaps it was for the best. Uh, He asks for one wish, which obviously didn't happen. Uh, Once you have read this letter, burn it. Uh, uh, although uh, because this letter probably came from the prison the prison probably copied it Um, uh, burn it then I want you to burn all of my personal letters given to Christine I do not do not discuss me with sympathetic relatives try hard to forget I even existed and then there's a PS on the end uh, which says and John who is his son 
uh, perhaps one day one of you will tell him I am very sorry. Uh, she, Kath, i.e. his uh, ex-wife, made it impossible for me to ever see him. I cordially detest her as a wife. She is she is a complete flop. What a lovely man. Anyway, um, time of the murder, when the murder was happening, um, there were a couple of people in the hotel working at the time. Uh, I didn't put them into the story because I felt we'd already kind of done everything we needed to but uh, there was a hall porter at the Shelbourne Hotel uh, uh, Joseph a, a lot of Polish workers here so um, which is why Christina was working there as well uh, he heard two screams ran into the hall saw Dennis standing very close to Christine he pulled Dennis off her uh, and he pulled Dennis onto the stairs uh, near the lounge doors uh, there was a struggle and Dennis was shouting, I want to see her. He said that twice. And Dennis said, I killed her because he, because I loved her. And with the aid, aid of the manager, he held him down until the police arrived. Uh, he, had, he said he had not seen Dennis here before. There was also an off-duty hall porter there as well called Michael. Uh, quite often in uh, a lot of the hotels, because there's a bar there and there's a place where you can get good food. And don't forget, this is an era where most people don't have their own kitchens which is why in a lot of these stories you hear me saying people are eating out is because they live in flats and all they have is like maybe a, a little stove where they can boil some water but they don't have, really have a, a kitchen uh so a lot of people eat out and actually eating out is quite cheap as well uh the hall porter was there michael um that's good timing my neighbor's just turned up so his generator is going to go on in a bit um uh michael perlock was there he was in the lounge he heard a very long scream he ran into the hall uh there was a big struggle going on um uh, christina had collapsed on the floor he tried he did really didn't know what was going on at that point he tried to lift her up as he thought she had fainted she was still alive but she was slowly slipping down the wall uh if you look into the photo i've posted some photos on um the all of the crime scene photos the original ones never seen before are on the patreon account you'll get those i might post one or two rare ones uh on my uh blog so you can have a look on my blog or it might be on social media not all of them but maybe a few um and if you notice in the shot you'll see a glass of water by her foot obviously he didn't know what was going on so he went to fetch her a glass of water which was absolutely useless uh also the manager was there uh, of the hotel uh, bronislau I'm not going to pronounce his surname because it's like it's like someone sneezed in a alphabetic spaghetti. Uh, he said, I noticed the knife in her chest. I pulled it out. It had been up to the handle, which was very good. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's said that she died instantly. But obviously, as you know, if someone has a knife in them, the one thing you don't do is pull out the knife because it's probably the, the fact that the blade is in there is probably the only thing that's stopping them from bleeding. And. If you look at the pictures as well, even though she was stabbed in the chest, there's no blood around her. There's no wound at the back of her. And because the knife was in, it went straight through her heart, uh, killed her artery. Basically, her whole body filled up with blood. But there was there's almost no blood came out of her. Nothing was spurting at all. So, it, so it's a really weird photo. Her eyes are open. Um, but yeah, it's, it, the, the autopsy said she died almost instantaneously uh what else was there uh yet yeah, they held him down until the police arrived uh, inspector leonard piercy and pc george yarnold arrived they arrived literally within minutes of the call uh christina by that point was already dead dennis had been res restrained um beside the body they saw the knife they also saw the rubber tubing which was basically the the kosh that he bought with him whether he used it we don't actually know he didn't seem to have uh uh, Dennis was moved to the lounge and PC Yarnold uh, kept him under observations obviously if this was police constable Arsenal Guinness he would have been slightly distracted by the fa fact that the lounge is also in the bar <laughs> oh, oh look at that they've got, they've got Guinness on tap well this is an official duty <laughs> oh, oh, I'll, just have, I'll just have three because uh, I've got a bit of a thirst on board <laughs> Um, it said that uh, uh, Dennis, when they were in the lounge, Dennis seemed a little bit quiet. Uh, the PC noticed that Dennis was putting something into his mouth behind the cover of a silk handkerchief. When he pushed his hand away, he saw that it was a bottle containing white powder, uh, which fell onto his knee. 
Uh, the officer, this is fantastic thinking. The officer opened Dennis's mouth, noticed that the white powder had, had basically stuck to his dentures. So he removed Dennis's dentures. He just pulled, he just yanked them out. Um, uh, and then he searched him. Uh, yeah, they, they later found out that it, it, it wasn't really a poison. It was just powdered aspirin. So the worst he was going to get is not a headache. Uh, friends had mentioned that uh, Dennis had been pestering Christina for absolutely months. Um, da -da -da. Dennis was arrested by uh, Chief Inspector George Jennings of F Division at 12.15 a.m. Uh, that was in the uh, ground floor lounge of the Shelbourne Hotel. Shelbourne Hotel, if you, uh, I'll, I'll post videos online. You'll see the videos and the pictures. It looks identical. It hasn't changed. It's it's posh now. It's now like a boutique hotel. Boutique hotel. But uh, the photos from before show it. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a homeless person's hotel, but it was like, do you know, it was a budget hotel. Do you know, it wasn't fancy at all. Unlike now, it's it's a it's a fancy pants hotel. Um, uh, Chief Inspector Jennings said, I am Chief Inspector Jennings and this is Inspector Woolner. I've heard of Inspector Woolner before. I don't remember which cases he dealt with before. I think he might have done some of the John George Haig. I'm sure he was on that one as well. Um, at 12.15 today, we saw the dead body of Christine Grenville at the foot of the stairs in the hall at this address, and from inquiries I've made, I've reason to believe that you murdered her by stabbing her to death with a knife. Dennis said, I killed her. Let's get away from here and get it over with quickly. He was cautioned and charged with the station. Um, whether I put this into the episode, I don't quite know, but this was a small detail that was in the investigation. That it, 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 It's kind of hard to know whether to put it in. Um, near the table where Dennis had been sat, um, they found a small piece of paper and he said, I put it there. This is the cause of the trouble. I will tell you all about it at the station, which he never did. The piece of paper was a breakfast menu from the, the merchant vessel, the, the Ruachin, where they met. Um, and on it, on the back, uh, was the name Christine Granville and her phone number, which was WES. 2619 which is what they'd given her which well, meant to be what he gave her when they met about a year ago but this is the other thing that's not explained if you look at the crime scene photo you'll see the picture of christine granville and in her left hand you'll see a pencil so it's not explained whether that was a number she was giving him now but it wouldn't make sense why she was giving him a number that number now or whether she was writing something else or we don't we just don't know we just don't know there are lots of details that are a little bit weird um what else have we got what else have we got uh yeah doctor arrives at uh, 11 p.m obviously that was pointless because she he'd confirmed that she'd been dead for about 30 minutes um in the report it says that a man claiming to be andre scarback uh, went to Kensington Mortuary uh, and identified her body. Problem is, Andre Scarbeck is her brother, and he died of TB in a uh, German prison cell a couple of years before. So it's not too sure whether the person was pretending to be her brother or whether it was actually her lover, Andre Kowalski. So uh, who who was in the UK at the time and was going under the uh, the name of uh, Andrew Kennedy, I think he was under. Whew. Anyway, right, okie Uh The night before they went to court on the 11th of September 1952, a, pre uh, a prison officer found that he had torn up his bed sheet, uh, which could have been made into an, a noose, and uh, Dennis said he was fashioning it into uh, da -da -da -da, um, a, you know, a noose, uh, but he, he wasn't really using it, and that the prison cell was incredibly dirty. Um, he said he threatened many times to kill himself, but he never did. Uh, prison staff said he was clearly an exhibitionist and a fantasist and showed no signs of insanity. Uh, as mentioned in all, all of the interviews, he um, um, he loved being interviewed. He loved the sound of his own voice. He loved telling his life story, even though it was dull. Uh, he likes to feel that he's impressive, uh, but he would get incredibly gener uh, jealous any time anyone would mention Christine as he felt that he should have been the attention of the interview and not them. Uh, he used his hands a lot. He was very expressive. Um, everyone said he was very much uh, 
acting, acting the part. The trial was held at the Central Criminal Court, which is the Old Bailey, under uh, Mr Justice Donovan. Uh, as mentioned, he refused legal advice and pleaded guilty. His tone in court was described as impertinent, and when sent- but when sentenced, he became more respectful. Uh, obviously, because he pleaded guilty, there was no point going to a trial. The trial lasted just three minutes. He stood there with his hands in his raincoat pocket. Uh, the clerk of the court said, you are charged with the murder of Christine Granville on the 15th of June this year. Are you guilty or not guilty? Dennis replied, guilty. Judge Donovan said, do you intend to he- adhere to the plea? Because if you do, there is only one thing left to do, and that is to pass sentence. Dennis said, quite. I would like you to do that as soon as possible. The judge said, uh, are you still determined not to be defended? Dennis said, quite. Uh, asked if there was anything to say in his defence, he said, I have nothing to say uh, whatsoever. So the judge put on his black cap and sentenced him to death. Obviously, during that, he, he asked uh, the judge to hurry it up. Uh, he also had a previous trial. Obviously, his committal was at West London Magistrates Court on the 16th of June. At that court, all you have to do when you go there is just say, uh, are you, da da da, and you go, yes, uh, you have been found guilty of this. Yes, I understand that. Uh, he was held at uh, Brixton Prison. Uh, let's go to the execution. So the execution was held on the 30th of September 1950. Obviously, um, you know, that's three weeks after his trial because he pleaded guilty and he didn't want any appeals process. So there was no appeals process, basically. They just set a date for his execution and it was done. 30th of September 1952 at 9am. This is at Pentonville Prison. So that's North London, that's kind of uh, uh, North, uh, yeah, King's Cross. Um, what, who was it? It was, this was actually the first, that can't be right. No, I'm not going to say that, because I think that detail is incorrect. Uh, what else? Oh, okay, yes. Um uh, when they interviewed Andre afterwards, after her murder, he said that they were planning, uh, she was planning to travel out to see him two days later and they were to be married. So that was Andre Kowalski, who was Andre Kennedy. Uh, as mentioned on a death certificate, do you know, her name is misspelled, which, do you know, it makes sense, do you know, um, do you know, she used multiple names, so, do you know. That sometimes happens. Her age is her age is incorrect. They put her as thirty seven, but that may, that's fine, you know, because she did she did change her age quite a few times. She was forty seven, but on there it says it's thirty seven. Even on her gravestone, her age is actually incorrect. Um, but I think what's m- most galling about this is, you know, didn't have her down as uh, spy hero, secret agent, or soldier, or you know her title, which was a uh, flying officer. Um, do you know, nothing like that. They they just put her down as former wife. Do you know? No, do you not? Do you know, they didn't even put her down in the job she had at that moment, housekeeper, which was her job. They just put former wife, not even wife, just divorcee, a former wife. I mean that that shows the era and the age and massive disrespect. Uh, buried in St Mary's Cemetery in Kensal Green. It's a lovely cemetery. You can have a good old walk walk around. Um, in 1971, the Shelbourne Hotel was bought by a Polish group. In the storeroom, they found her trunk containing her clothes, papers, uh, an SOE issue dagger. Uh, this dagger, her medals, and some of her papers are now held in the Polish Institute and Sikorsky Museum at, Prin- at 20 Prince's Gate, which is not too far from where she was murdered and not too far away from John George Haig, that kind of area. Um, in May 19, in May 2017, a bronze bust uh, was unveiled at the Polish uh, Hearth Club in Kensington. Uh, I've got some pictures of that online, so you can have a look at that. Uh, and in 2020, obviously this year, supposedly English Heritage announced that it would place a blue plaque honouring Christina Scarbeck on the site of the former Shelbourne Hotel, which is number one Lexham Gardens. Uh, it's not there as of yet. And obviously, with the way things are going, there may be a bit of a delay on that. Andre Kowalski, also known as Andrew Kennedy, uh, who was her, her old friend. They actually knew each other from about the age of 10. Uh, he was an old family friend. 
they met in her stables and kind of became old friends from them and they kind of went through the years uh he he was a, a polish soldier later to become a, a a major and an soe agent they kind of became lovers throughout life um he died of cancer in munich in december 1988 uh, and upon his his death, his ashes were flown and interred at the foot of Christina Scarbeck's grave. Um, and as mentioned, um, she's got a new headstone there. Uh, uh, what a new kind of renovated one uh, done by the Polish Heritage Society. Uh, the headstone reads uh, Christine Scarbeck Grenville. So they've hyphenated her name. Uh, um, the date of birth is wrong but that's kind of uh, to be forgiven <sighs> right let's answer those questions Ooh, where were they right slurp of my tea oh right 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 Ooh, okay uh, question number one what title were Christina's parents what were their title their title was Count and Countess. Obviously, he was Count Jertzy Scarbeck and she was Countess Christina Goldfeder. There's a lot of names in here. It's a bit of a real struggle to edit. Not edit it, but just pronounce things. I was practicing yesterday and I still got them wrong. Uh, question two. Which ski resort in Poland did Christina train at and which former Polish soldier uh, was born there? from an episode earlier in the season right so uh the polish ski resort was zakopane which is in the tatra mountains and the former polish soldier well oh, actually he was really an airman uh was felix sturber who was the polish officer who had the the kind of lover's death pact with barbara shuttleworth i think that was like the second or third episode in this season uh, so interestingly so they probably cross paths because the, the times do kind of marry up um uh question three what was christina's first ordinary job after her father's death the answer was she worked in a car dealership it was a, a fiat dealership but she had to give it up because the car fumes uh, affected her pneumonia question four what did christina have under her armpits when confronted by two German troops. Uh, it was two live grenades. Two live grenades, obviously, with the, with the pins taken out. So she popped them under underneath her armpits. She'd taken out the pins and she's standing there with two, two bloody grenades under her armpits. Fantastic. That's a great... Her, her thing was, you know, you know, if you come near me, basically, I'm going to die, but you're going to die as well. Uh now obviously the, the, the it was two german troops and obviously they were wise enough to go yeah this isn't worth dying for <laughs> uh, question five uh how did a high-ranking official describe christina to the soe special operations executive his exact words were she's a flaming polish patriot a great adventurous and absolutely bloody fearless i think that's a fantastic way to describe her uh question six uh what was the code name of hitler's mission to invade his ally the soviet union that was operation barbarossa obviously she was she was the uh she got the first footage of that the first proof that uh actually Ger german troops were massing uh on the border ready to invade uh uh russia Question seven, uh, what were Christina's four awards from the British and French governments? Uh, she got an OBE, uh, which was pretty amazing because uh, normally that kind of award you, you would only give to people who are kind of, uh, I think they say it's lieutenant colonel and, and above. And she was given the honorary award of flying officer. Um, so that was pretty amazing. She got an MBE, which many f kind of uh, female uh, agents also got as well uh she got the george medal which is uh, uh it's for uh civilian acts of valor and the croix de guerre which is uh, a, a very prestigious french award uh so it's the obe mbe george medal and croix de guerre uh, uh question eight uh where were the headquarters of the special operations executive based 
that was at 64 Baker Street so a place that we visited many t many times before on Baker Street uh, and there's uh, there'll be uh, I'm gonna post that video on uh, on my website as well so you can see that um, question nine what three weapons did Dennis take with him to kill her and himself they were a sheath knife a kosh and a vial of poison which obviously, as we know, was <laughs> granulated aspirin. Uh, kind of weird, because in that era, you could kind of get a lot of poisons quite easily. Uh, well, things that we would regard, regard as poisons now, like strychnine, was still being used as kind of a, an, a, to an antidote to many things. So it's kind of weird that... <sighs> Maybe he just maybe he just was the type of person that you go into a pharmacist and people go, I'm not going to give you anything except an aspirin. Uh, question 10. Christina was her middle name or one of her middle names along with Janina. But what was her first name? Her first name was Maria. So there you have it. There you have it. That episode, that was good. Oh, I just need to sit down now and get this done. It's Friday now. <sighs> if I slug my guts out now, this might be done by Sunday evening. I think. I hope. Because I need to. I've got things to do on Monday. I, I, oh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm super busy. I'm literally back to back. So I need to power down and get this done. But I'm not going to. It's not going to be a substandard episode. It needs to be absolutely pin sharp. Poor dear. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, that was that. So don't forget, next week is uh, uh, Meander Mile. I'm looking forward to these because there, there's quite a few cases on there where there's things that I've just I've never heard of before. I'm like, oh, these are some interesting cases. But as you'll hear, they're cases where I can never do an episode about them. You'll never hear about them again because there's just nothing. Like there's people people in Chinatown just don't talk. They don't talk about any cases. So uh, that's why I'm doing an episode on that, and then we'll do the Piccadilly, and then we'll do the do the uh, the the uh, what are they called <sighs> the new episodes. That I can't remember what I'm calling them. <sighs> Begins with an S, I think. Oh, my brain's gone. Anyway, that's the end of the episode. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a long extra mile. I'm going to shut up my face. I'm going to drink my tea. I'm going to have my cake. Uh, I'm going to have a little walk in a bit, and then um, uh, that's that. So I hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, I look forward to your company again soon. Stay safe and be well. Bye-bye.